Visionaries is brought to you from the generous support of Grand Island Chamber of Commerce, Nebraska Tourism Commission, and the Parker Family Foundation. Sometimes you read the paper and watch the news and it seems like there's more bad news than good in the world. But you know what? It's just not true. I at least can hold on to something, that there's something, maybe it's small, but there's something that I'm doing to make a difference. It's just a feeling that you have. You can help people. You have to. There's no alternative. Every child has potential that we just can't know. And so to my mind, that's what we're doing. We are saving potential for the future. We called them pioneers, the men and women who dared to go west. When they arrived in the place we now call Nebraska, they were mesmerized by the stunning beauty of lush grasslands brimming with life. It was awe-inspiring because the prairie seemed to go on forever. But now this prairie is being challenged by our demand for food, and the once endless grassland is now abundant in corn that feeds the world. It is estimated that 99% of the tall grass prairie and the habitat that was once home to thousands of species is gone forever. But the good news is a new breed of pioneer is on the last vestiges of prairie. They are in places like the Crane Trust in Grand Island, Nebraska, where nearly 10,000 acres of prairie is being nurtured back to its historic state by a dynamic group and environmental scientists and government agencies working with local farmers and ranchers toward ensuring that future generations can experience the prairie as their ancestors once did. We take you now to the only place in North America where sandhill cranes, half a million of them, are drawn to roost on their spectacular annual migration. What you can see here is a large area of Platte River. We see some of the last tall grass prairie that remains in the state, um, as well as several parcels of mixed grass prairie. Most of those prairies left intact are owned by conservation organizations like the Crane Trust. Sometimes people live on top of something and they don't actually notice it. Uh, they can walk past something every day, but if it's pointed out, and if there's somebody who loves whatever it is and, and points out how beautiful it is or how fascinating it is, um, how sad it would be if it wasn't there anymore. I was flying, yeah, running down a dream that never would come to me. Working on a mystery, going wherever it leads, running down a dream. Okay, if I can ever move up here. I felt so good. This thing like away. anything was possible. This is what you call a, a tall and mixed grass prairie. 99% of the tall and mixed grass prairie in Nebraska is gone. And it's never coming back. So there's little pieces of it like this that the Crane Trust and, and other conservation organizations are protecting. And so we want to bring people out here and let you see it and let you experience it and use it so that when you leave, you know why it's important because this is what Nebraska looked like when the pioneers came through. So I think it's really important to let people come out here, connect and see, hey, there is something out here and it's good. And I can still do the things I like to do and the animals can still do the things they have to do. So I want you to have a good, good time, be safe. If, if something happens, you happen to twist an ankle, nobody's coming for you. So, not just like the pioneer. Just like the pioneer. You know, you become, <laughs> if, you, if you do twist an ankle, you, you kind of go from being a runner to being food. So you're, at, you're actually putting back into the ecosystem. So that's... What people understand and love, they'll protect. Go. And what they are not familiar with, then Come it doesn't on. matter. 
whether it's people that come out and view wildlife and enjoy that experience or whether it's a, a, a part of the public that, that, that is actively engaged in hunting or fishing or just bird watching, they have to be engaged and they need to be have an opportunity to be part of the ecosystem rather than than, than something that's just uh, set aside from the, from the ecosystem and what's happening. We're always looking for ways to get people to interact with the prairie. People may not normally come out here, aren't, aren't trained conservationists. We have about 100 runners out there. Most of these people have never been here before. The name Crane Trust can confuse some people. Obviously, we have a half a million sandhill cranes and the whooping cranes come through here. And we manage our, our lands and, and the, the habitat that we own. We manage it for the cranes and other migratory birds. But, but the mission of the Crane Trust is to protect and maintain habitat. One of the things that separates the Crane Trust a little bit, we have a, an education piece here where we have grad students that come out and spend the summer and work on their degrees. We had middle school children here yesterday in the river with a biologist doing experiments. We had mountain bikers out here riding bikes. We have a hundred runners out here today, all of them interacting. And that all comes in because we have scientists here that are managing this habitat. So what we do here is first and foremost protect and maintain the prairie. Prairies are diverse mosaics and they were historically structured by wildfires and grazing. And now we're introducing bison. And bison is gonna change the land. It's gonna change it for the better. It's gonna take it back to what it was. And we're gonna be able to do experiments to know exactly what happens when bison are reintroduced. And so what we try to do is, is first and foremost protect those habitats from development or other human alterations. And once they're set aside and protected, to manage them so that they function somewhat as they did historically. The cranes have a historical and almost spiritual relationship with the bison. They were here together before anybody had ever been here. Before the French traders came up, before the Oregon Trail was here, there were cranes and bison. And that's what we're going to replicate. We're going to take about 2,000 acres and we're going to reintroduce bison to that land. And then we're going to sit back and, and follow our base studies and see what happens to the grass species, see what happens to the insects. And then watch the cranes, when they come every spring, interact with the new habitat that's been created because we introduced bison. The land, the, the prairie, like that, has to be more important than just a conservationist. It needs to be important to everybody. It needs to be important to moms and dads that live in the city. That there's a place that their grandchildren or their great-grandchildren are gonna still be able to come because there's organizations like the Crane Trust. And I think, we think straight it's, imp ahead. straight yep. ahead, is that we think it's an important that the, that the everyday person gets, gets to touch this and, and understand how important it is. We're, we're standing right now at Shoemaker Island. It's got a history with, with uh, French explorers back in the 1700s. It's uh, very near Mormon Island where the Mormon wagon train came through several hundred years ago. And it looks just about the way it did hundreds of years ago. Mormon Island is a, a section of the prairie that is bordered on two sides by the Platte River channels. This part of Mormon Island was, was never tilled and it's an area that has long been an island. It was very important as a higher elevation site for a lot of the travelers who came across the Great Plains as a, a reliable place that they could set up camp and be protected from high water. It was under private ownership after settlement of this region for many decades, and then came under conservation protection in the late 1970s, and it has been managed by the Crane Trust since then. Land management is a really critical component. Any real sound wildlife management for any species is really based on sound wildlife management and wildlife management practices. If you actually get down into the grass, you can find lizards, you can find snakes, you can find all kinds of insects. There, there's hundreds of plant species. We were just uh, did a plant survey just doing like 10 plots and found, I think, about 100 plants just in these 10 small little plots going through those grassland and, and we found almost 100 species. Without good science, good stewardship, 
good conservation practices and a lot of restoration and management, a lot of the species here will, will not survive. When were the cameras set up? This camera was placed out February through about May for our first video. Why did you choose this location for the camera? Uh, it's a slough area that we saw a lot of cranes using, so we had actually 10 cameras placed out here and kind of did a shotgun approach to some of the areas that we knew birds to be using, hoping that we could get a lot of imagery of the birds. And so all we need to do is basically open that up and make sure that it's functioning. You know, this time-lapse camera is still recording. Um, it just takes about a dozen batteries and it'll record up to 40,000 images on that set of batteries. This is important scientifically because it allows us to get a view that nobody, nobody else can get. We're out here in an area that is kind of excluded from human traffic and we're able to use these low profile cameras basically to get in with the flock um, of, of birds. We're right at their eye level. We have birds as close as four or five foot away from the camera doing you know, their normal routine. So it's, it's great because it allows us to study the birds the whole year when they're only here for a couple of months. Beyond this gate, uh, what you're going, what you're going to see is is a controlled burn. All right, you guys, we're we're about to begin our uh, North Meadow uh, growing season prescribed fire, so we're just going to have a briefing. Fire is really important. Fire is probably one of our best. Uh, management tools that we have. It's, it's an historic process. In the past, in the prairie times, when the pioneers were here, these occurred naturally. And, and it's a key part of our three-step management of the, prior, of the prairie. We, we burn, we rest, and then we graze it. So in this part of the, uh, of the river, fires probably came through every five to seven years, typically. And uh, they not only uh, burned away any vegetation from the river, but they helped set back uh, any invasive plants that we might have had. They helped stimulate new plant growth. Um, they kept the trees out of a lot of the wet meadows and a lot of the system. And uh, we just don't have wildfire today unless it's actually by a prescription. And what we're trying to do is set up a, uh, a ground season burn along with, um, it's going to facilitate grazing in our wetland meadows. And we're trying to set back our grass component and see if we can't get a little more diversity out in our wet meadows with some sedges and some uh, forbs and wildflowers. So we're also trying to, we're trying to start a new uh, growing season monitoring plan with this burn. We'll get the uh, process started. Time, if you uh, take on too much smoke, we'll just swap you out with somebody else and just make sure you're staying hydrated. Keep it going. I always try to document as we go through the go through the burn. I'm not missing anything, or we can look at trends. Well, the, the Fish and Wildlife Service, along with the Crane Trust, have really pioneered uh, working in and, and managing uh, braided river systems out in the Great Plains. The Platte River is one of the most appropriated rivers in the world in terms of water extractions. Most of the water in the Platte River system now 
is diverted before it ever gets here. It's all it's diverted in Colorado on the South Platte. It's diverted in Wyoming and, and Western Nebraska. And so, just a tiny percentage of water that used to be here gets here now. And uh, because of the abatement of prairie fires, we're seeing a gallery forest now that occurs all across the state along the Platte River, which has very much changed its character. Those big cottonwood trees are just sucking water out. What happens is a lot of the scouring flows used to clean the sandbars, used to clean out the weeds and, and uh, regenerate the cottonwoods. Those are gone. So normally all this, what we're sitting on right now, this would all be underwater at this time of year. It would, uh, this would be flooding from snow melt out in the Rockies and we'd, this would probably, heck, the tractor would be in about five foot of water right now and it'd just be tearing all this up with everything it's pulling down with it. And what used to happen when there was a great deal of water in the river was that you'd have huge ice flows that would come down and they basically clean the river. They would scrape the sandbars, they would take off the small trees and plants and grasses that were on the sandbars and would clean the river, which is healthy for the river. It's also exactly what the cranes need. Today we, we see annual flows that are maybe 10 or 15 percent of what their peak flows might have been at one time and those historic scouring flows, those high pulse flows, washed away all the vegetation, they scoured out the channel, they, they, they actually moved the river uh, back and forth across the, the, the valley and the floodplain and the uh, kind of the braided plain form of the river was ever changing. But the things that the water used to do, it doesn't do anymore, so now man has to do it. And so that's a lot of what the Crane Trust does. They intervene, they do prescribed fires, they, they clear the sandbars, they look at ways, help us to bring water down into the system. First we clear the brush and then we take the disc. So again, we're recreating what the river used to do. We're uh, chewing up the ground, chewing up the vegetation, the root balls. So that way when the water does come up, it can take some of the sediment away, recreate some of the sandbars out there in the river channel, in which the sandbars are used for roosting for the cranes. We do this about every three years is all it's needed. And we try to recreate the best we can what the river did back before there was dams and stuff put on it. The uh, maintenance they're doing on the, on the vegetation, on the banks, clearing the river, is creating much more of the river that existed here before settlement. Who's that yonder dressed in red? Way in the water Must be the children that Moses led God's gonna trouble the world and a good deal of our kids come from bigger cities, actually, you know, Lincoln and Omaha. Uh, and many of those kids from the cities, they've never been in a river in their life. They've never set foot in a real river. And I always tell them that uh, to truly be a Nebraskan, you need to do what Lauren Isley did in the immense journey. You need to lay on your back in the Platte River and let the current just carry you and watch the clouds go over and have that experience. And uh, these kids get to have that experience. I met Jane about uh, 15 years ago at a book signing and lecture in Boulder, Colorado. My introduction to the cranes was sitting in an airplane and reading about them in an Airways magazine. But don't, that didn't migrate south. She asked about cranes, just came up. We, I told her I was from Nebraska, I suppose, and she read something in the magazine about cranes. And I said, I just happened to have a cabin on the Platte River right in the heart of crane country. I read about these cranes and it was really describing the magic of their calls. And from that moment on, it they kept playing around in the back of my mind. And somehow, when I met Tom Mangelson, the subject of the cranes came up. And I said, oh, I've always wanted to go to that migration. It sounds magical. And I said, what are you doing in March? She said, I'm going with you to see the cranes. That was 12, 13 years ago. And she's come back every year. The plant is, it was historically a mile wide and an inch deep. It's not a mile wide anymore, but in most places, it's still an inch deep. Well, growing up here and then learning more about the cranes, 
I recognized the value of the, of the river over the years, what was happening to it. I mean, it was a no-brainer to see that, you know, all these islands were growing up and, and um, the river kept getting more and more narrow and deeper. And, and uh, you could tell the cranes, they need certain, you know, they like submerged sandbars and sandbars, places to roost that, that they can see. What you're watching is, is that they're coming through and they're, they're finding the sandbars and they'll avoid deeper parts of the river because they don't swim. Just about every crane, sandhill and hooping crane, comes through the central fly zone. That central fly zone is like an hourglass. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, it's a 5,000 mile journey for some of these birds, you know, from their nesting grounds to their wintering areas in the Gulf of Mexico and back. You know, it's amazing birds, amazing flight, an amazing story. They'll come all to this 50 mile stretch of the river and then spread back out again from eastern Canada clear into Siberia. I followed the cranes on these trips of geographic from, from northern Canada to Texas and back three times. And they landed in the same, some of the same marshes and lakes in Texas and Oklahoma and uh, North Dakota that they had in pre previous years. The sandhills go back to the fields every day, every morning to continue feeding, because they're putting on 20% of their body weight so that they can continue their migrations. Chuck's my dad. You know, he came out here about three years ago and he, he told me about some of the experiences he was having out here. He said, well, maybe you should come out and, and see what we're doing out here. What I found over the last three years is, is that I didn't know anything about what was going on here, that I didn't understand. I'd heard about the cranes, but I hadn't been out here to see them. It was once I got into a crane truss blind and I got to experience what really is magical. It's not something you can ever really explain until you see it. So he really brought me out here, got me into the blind, and, and to see all of these different types of birds uh, you know, land right in front of us and passing right over ahead of us, it's just an, an inspiring experience. It's an experience that, that I can't tell you about. It's an experience you can't see pictures of or a movie. It's something you gotta, you gotta be here in person. And, and watch nature unfold right before your eyes. And it's a, it's a magical thing to see. It's, it's the wave. You know, we have, uh, you know, we have one of the great North American phenomenons happening right here in Nebraska. And it doesn't feel like very many people know about us. So he brought me on board really to try and create this awareness to let people know what's happening out here. And, I grew up in Iowa, you know, in rural areas, and I don't think I have ever, like Rob just said, I've never come out and just really sat and just enjoyed nature. And to see this and to see all of the cranes together and talking to one another and doing their dance, and it makes you wonder, like, what are they saying? And do different sounds mean different things? And, and I just, I'm, I'm in complete awe. I think it's the sheer mass of all the cranes that I wasn't expecting. I've heard about the cranes. I've lived in Nebraska my whole life, and I didn't know it would be this many cranes, so it's just amazing. Um, I just never expected it to be such an amazing deal. I think it's an, um, it's an awe-inspiring thing that, you know, you, you can think about and you can see a map, but to say that, that this, is, this is something that's truly Nebraska, I think it's, th th there's, a, there's something about the sound and watching them come in in the evening when they start off like grey smoke and the smoke comes closer and it turns into these amazing shapes and patterns and the noise gets louder mm. and the noise coming from the roosts gets, sometimes it depends how close you are, really deafening. And seeing the shining surface of the, you know, this ribbon-like plait gradually filling up with the grey feathers until it looks like a solid carpet. And then an eagle goes over and yo, oh, the millions of wings fluttering and, and uh, a deafening roar as they take off into the air. And they're gone. And they're gone for another year. And I'm always wondering, you know, what, what, what's going on in the mind? What, what is this migratory drive? What is it? It's something I'll never understand and nobody will really. What makes them do it? And how much do they think about it? How much? I don't know. It's, it is a sort of magic because we can't possibly imagine what it's like to be a migrating crane. Have 
I want to go home and tell everyone to come here. I really do. I mean, I can't wait to like tell all my family and friends and people that have lived in the Midwest for years. You have to go. Yep. Stop taking it for granted. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. because Nebraska, it's all about. Or we experience nature, I'd say, more so than the larger metropolitan cities across the country. And, you know, you just figure I'll get out here one day and, you know, get out here sooner rather than later. Make it say. happen. So, you know, you said something in your head or in your heart, but, you know, this is, this is not a photograph, you know. I mean, the world's best photograph is not even not even on the same radar as something like this. Being able to see it move, feel the pulse of, of all these birds moving together, it's just... You know, it's something that's going to stick with you. One day, you may have to tell your grandchildren stories about places like this. The folks in Grand Island, Nebraska, have something special you just have to experience. For the Visionaries, I'm Sam Waterston.